Welcome to our first NF California virtual webinar scheduled during May as part of NF Awareness Month. The purpose of this webinar is to help the NF community of patients and medical providers know some of the major resources in California. Over the past 15 years or so, we, meaning Debbie, Bell, Maria Powell, and myself, Katie Sparing, have organized symposiums or Ask the Doctor meetings at each of the institutions represented by today's speakers. But at the pace of one or two educational events per year, it takes us a long time to make our way through the state and maintain current information about the doctor services available in a given region. Families often contact us when they need to find a doctor and it's important that we give good information. So today with the marketing and technical help of Brianna from NF Network, the national organization that we belong to, we are honored to host a webinar that allows the NF community to hear from specialists from UC Davis, UC San Francisco, Kaiser Oakland, Stanford, Children's Hospital at Los Angeles, Dr. Panosian, UCLA, Cedar sinai Children's Hospital Orange County, UC Irvine, UC San Diego, and Rady Children's Hospital. Our doctor rep representative from Loma Linda University is not able to be with us today, but we will gather and distribute information about Loma Linda as well as all the institutions represented today as follow part of our follow-up process. The agenda for today requires the speakers to keep to a strict schedule. So without delay, we invite UCSF to, to introduce us to their services. Thank you. Fantastic. Good morning, everyone. Um, can you see? Let's see. Can you see? I'm not seeing my screen. So I'm seeing a Zoom screen. Do I have privileges to share my screen? I saw your I saw your screen for a split oh, second. You did. Okay. You see yep, it now? Yep, I see it now. Yep, I see it. Okay. For some reason, it's not. Okay, I'll just. You'll see my face. I'm going to have to look at a different monitor, but that should be fine. I'm make sure I can advance. Hmm. For some reason, I'm getting the schedule Zoom meeting on my screen. Let me try. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. We should be. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you, Kate, for the introduction. And I know there's a lot of people presenting today, and I think it's really exciting to get um, all the different programs and providers in California together because I think we really do have a lot to offer patients. My name is Alyssa Reddy. I'm a pediatric neurologist and neuro-oncologist by training. I came to California um, almost three years ago. I came here from the University of Alabama, Birmingham, which many of you know. Um, has had a long time interest in NF, and I worked very closely with Dr. Bruce Korf there, and we were the operations um, site and a charter member of the NF Clinical Trials Consortium. So I've been really excited to bring some of the knowledge and studies that we had ongoing in, in Birmingham to San Francisco. I'm just going to quickly run through our program for both pediatric and adult patients. So this is a list of our pediatric specific providers. We do have providers dedicated to taking care of patients with NF and pretty much all subspecialties. Um, many of the people um, we coordinate through or make referrals to, but as you can see, uh, we have pretty much all of, of the um, necessary subspecialists covered. And all of these providers have um, not only interest, but experience and expertise in caring for our children with neurofibromatosis. I do want to mention our multidisciplinary clinic. This is a clinic um, we, we see a benefit to, to children, especially those that are preschool before they start school, adolescents, and then adult transition. But what, but this clinic meets monthly. It only meets once a month. Currently, we have this in Mission Bay, but we are going to expand it to our Oakland um, Children's Hospital in 2022. And um, the patients that we, we think are appropriate for these, this clinic is those that need to see three or more of the specialists that come to the clinic. So the, the specialists that participate are neurology, neuro-oncology, neuropsychology, rehabilitation medicine, social work, and ophthalmology. And um, what's nice is, especially for people that come a distance, is that you can see everyone in a day. It can be a long day, but we are able to put together a comprehensive assessment with both a pre and post clinic meeting that we have. 
we are also able to, to do a, a same day MRI if an MRI is indicated and coordinate with other subspecialists to do endocrinology or orthopedic surgery that may be necessary. These are our adult providers. Uh, we have an um, excellent um, lead for this, Dr. Jessica Schulte. Unfortunately, Dr. Schulte is being recruited away from us to UC, UC San Diego. So um, those in the southern part of the state will have a, access to her, although I do think she'll be able to telehealth, but we are going to actively recruit to replace her. But you will see we also have a, a, a pretty strong list of adult providers. I would um, like to um, point out Dr. Lynn Jacks, who's an expert in peripheral nerve uh, neurosurgeon with expertise in peripheral nerve tumors, and, and she is, is really um, quite skilled and quite good at this. But we, again, have a, have a list of providers in all areas for these patients. I want to pivot just a little bit and talk about some of the clinical trials that we have available at, at UCSF. Um, many of you may have heard that NF type 1 falls into a, a, a group of disorders that are sometimes referred to as rasopathies, and that's because of um, abnormalities in what's known as the rat mass kinase pathway. And this, this um, pathway controls uh, things with cell cycle and differentiation. And so when this pathway is dysregulated, um, many things can happen. One of the things that we know can happen when this pathway is abnormal is that neurofibromas can form. And obviously, neuro neurofibromas can be a significant problem for patients with NF. And what happens is in every cell in a, in a patient's body with NF, they do have one abnormal copy of the NF gene. When a neurofibroma forms, the, the, the neurofibroma obtains basically, or the Schwann cells obtain basically a second abnormal copy, and that's what causes the neurofibroma to, to form. And then in rare cases, other changes occur, and this becomes a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. One thing that's gone on in the last decade or so is looking at inhibitors of the RAS pathway um, that could potentially uh, uh, slow down the growth of neurofibromas or reverse it and even be effective in other areas of NF. So many different um, drugs have, have been tried. And um, unfortunately, with, with sort of some good and some not good um, success. But we all know that, that more recently, or, or maybe you have heard or not heard that this, um, but lacking this part of the pathway called MEC has been successful. And I also want to mention that one of the scientists at UAB Dr. Frank McCormick has been very instrumental in looking at this pathway and trying to find specific um, pathway inhibitors to, to treat NF. So here's a, here's a paper. This is a study that was run by the group in, uh, at NIH. And this is the study that actually led to the approval of the MEK inhibitor selumetinib to treat neurofibromas. And what this plot shows is the, the decrease in size of the, each patient's plexiform on the study, um, it's the best response that they had on selumetinib, and this is just at different dosing. So these results were published at first in 2016. But probably more important for patients and families to earn is to understand how this helped the patient. So this is a young girl who had a big neurofibroma of, of her um, hip and, and um, going in, um, down her, her leg. And you can see the very the bright white is an MRI that shows a neurofibroma over time. So this is at baseline, and this is after five months of the drug and 10 months of the drug. And we can see that it gets smaller, but more importantly, we can see how it improved um, her posture and her stance. And we can imagine that her gait improved. So these are the kind of responses that are being seen with selumetinib and what led to the approval. Um, at UCSF, we've uh, run another a trial, another phase two trial with a different MEK inhibitor called Benamitinib. What's nice about Benamitinib is it does come in an oral form. So our study was fairly similar to the, we had a lot of the same objectives in terms of response and duration of therapy. One thing we've done with this study though is we, we did require that patients had to stop the drug at, at um, 24 months because we wanna see how many of the tumors start to grow after stopping and we do have a retreatment arm. So this, when we also were looking at exploratory aims, just quality of life, functional assessment, and then depending on the location of the, of the plexiform, things like vision, disfigurement, bowel and bladder dysfunction. 
So the study has a, um, close to a cruel, and this is some data that we presented last uh, winter um, at the ISPNO meeting. So similar to selumetinib, we are seeing really nice responses in the patient. Again, we used 20% as, as a partial response. You can see all the patients actually had some decrease in their plexiform and 70% met the criteria for a partial response. This is again, the best response. We need to see what happens over time once they stop the drug. This is an example of a patient who had a, had a facial plexiform. So you can see here on the left is the patient before starting, and then this is after eight cycles. Uh, the graph also depicts the volume. So this, the black line is before the patient started the benimitinib. So we can see that the, the plexiform was increasing over time. And then the red is, is the decrease over time. So we're really excited about this. There's obviously more work to do, but definitely the MEK inhibitors are showing tremendous um, progress. Some of the other studies that we have open at UCSF, we have the, um, the CTF-sponsored optic um, pathway glioma natural history study. This is a really good study to help us understand uh, which patients really need treatment and when the best time to intervene is. We do have the COG trial open, which is actually putting selumetinib into upfront treatment for patients with um, progressive or symptomatic optic pathway gliomas. We are about to open a phase two uh, study with the drug meridimitinib. This is being sponsored by Springworks. This is another mechanitibitor. Uh, what is nice about this is that it does come in a granular formulation. So again, good for small children. And we're working with AstraZeneca who made selumetinib because obviously there's a lot of questions still to answer about the drug, long-term effects, retreatment, and also um, absorption of the drug. Just want to give you an example of a patient, though, that I treated. This is a, a young lady with NF who had bilateral progressive optic, um, or excuse me, low-grade gliomas in her basal ganglia. She was pretty symptomatic from this. The, she had been through many different of um, standard treatments, and this is um, after about a year and a half of treatment on selumetinib. So excellent response. And again, we're studying this in the upfront setting for the children's oncology group. So um, just to summarize our, our clinical program, we, we've seen over 700 patients in the last five years at UCSF. About half of those are um, under 18, which means the other half are over, so both adult and pediatrics. We are um, um, looking to grow both our pediatric and adult programs, um, and we're expanding to our Oakland campus for our pediatric programs. We also um, have a lot of sort of basic translational science ongoing on the UCSF campus. Dr. Kevin uh, Shannon, um, who worked closely with Frank McCormick, who I mentioned earlier, is a co-PI of the only NF score grant. Um, and this grant is looking at new treatments for a variety of conditions related to NF. Uh, Dr. Cynthia Chin is a neuroradiologist who's very interested in doing MRI sequencing to really help distinguish plexiforms from malignant peripheral nerve tumors. And Dr. Harish Venezuelan um, is working in the lab on trying to understand why some plexiform neurofibromas transform to malignant peripheral nerve seek tumors. So in closing, I certainly would like to thank um, NF California for the opportunity today to present our program, of course, to all the patient families and to um, CTF, who also supports our and other programs. I think it's just it's a big team effort, and we're really happy to be part of the, uh, the team also wanted to show um, this picture of San Francisco City Hall that was lit up in honor of NF month. One of our patient families convinced um, the mayor's office to do this, and it was a lot of fun to have that done. So just on right, my last slide, if you're interested in our um, NF program, then there's coordinator is Jamie Manning, and there's also information on our website. Thank you. Thank you. Brianna, am I on? Yes, you are. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. And then um, we will get all the contact information out after our um, meeting sometime in the next week or so. Now I'd like to introduce our Stanford group. We have Dr. Campton and Dr. Stevenson here today. Dr. Camden, you're actually still muted. Yeah, let me get myself unmuted here. Thank you so much. And I'll go ahead and share. 
Right. Um, so thank you so much to Debbie, Katie, and Brianna for inviting us to speak today. I'm so heartened to see how many providers are offering fantastic care for folks with NF. I think it's really a change in the era, both in terms of treatment and in terms of advocacy and awareness. Um, so we're just thrilled to be here, part of this um, really robust team of doctors who can, can help you. Um, so we have both um, a pediatric uh, NF center and an adult NF center. I have the privilege of talking about both today. Dr. Stevenson and I co-direct the Children's uh, Neurofibromatosis Center. Dr. Stevenson is part of the medical genetics team and I'm a neurologist and a neuro-oncologist um, here at Stanford. So in our NF um, neuro-oncology clinic, we treat gliomas, plexiform neurofibromas, meningiomas, ependymomas, schwannomas. Um, we treat both NF1 and, and NF2 as well as schwannomatosis. And we really do, um, as a neurologist, um, I wanna focus on maximizing every child's potential. And we have um, neuropsychiatric testing as well as school advocacy available within our clinic. We also um, do coordinate our visits with um, MRIs as well as neuroophthalmology, social work, neuropsych testing, um, and other subspecialists as well. Um, our coordinator and um, amazing uh, neuro nurse practitioner is Trish Farzadi, um, who's uh, a wonderful um, addition to our clinic in the last couple of years. Um, we do have um, many clinical as well as observational trials available to participate in. So we also have the Springworks Mertametinib uh, clinical trial for plexiform neurofibromas. We, we are actively enrolling on that. Um, we also have the COG or Children's Oncology Group trial, the ACNS 1831 that Dr. Reddy was talking about, looking at upfront untreated um, gliomas in children with NF1 and selumetinib versus carboplatin and Christine. I think this is a really important question to answer, whether there is inferiority or superiority of selumetinib versus our standard um, carboplatin and Christine. Certainly, selumetinib is easier to administer, easier to take, doesn't require um, intravenous administration. Um, and so it'll be really important to know moving forward whether we can um, assure families that this is just as eff efficacious as our prior gold standard in uh, glioma. As well, we are part of the Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium, and we have a study looking at um, progressive gliomas in the context of NF1, looking at trametinib, uh, which is the MEK inhibitor, um, with the addition of hydroxychloroquine, which has been shown uh, to have some synergy with MEK inhibition for progressive gliomas, gliomas that may have grown while on uh, MEK inhibition. We also have um, the NF-associated optic pathway glioma natural history study. As many of you know, um, optic pathway gliomas are an important um, cause of vision loss in children with NF1, but it's unclear to us at this time which, why certain children develop optic pathway gliomas with NF and why others don't, why some develop optic pathway gliomas and they go on to cause vision loss, whereas others remain stable or even melt away on their own. And so this study is, is trying to answer those really important questions to know who, with whom we should be more aggressive in treatment and who we can um, allow to, um, to just follow. In addition to that, we're really uh, focused on um, trying to answer some of the questions about neurocognitive deficits in children with NF1. And both Tamar Green, whom you'll hear from um, shortly, who's a psychiatrist at uh, Stanford, and myself both have um, uh, studies looking at uh, neurocognition and neuroimaging correlates. So um, uh, more to come on that. So to talk a little bit about Dr. Stevenson's portion of our clinic, he again is a medical geneticist. He is um, incredibly experienced in the world of NF and is a leader nationally in NF. Um, his particular research interest is in skeletal dysplasias and bony abnormalities of children and adults with NF. He treats both um, children and adults and heads up our rasopathy portion of our clinic. And he works very closely with Ellen Farrelly, who is a um, licensed genetic counselor um, and in the Rasopathies Clinic. So conditions we treat at Stanford Children's with reference to um, NF 
are uh, the tumors um, significant in NF1, gliomas, plexiform neurofibromas, pheochromocytomas, leukemia, MKNST, skeletal dysplasias, uh, pseudoarthrosis, scoliosis, developmental delays and learning challenges. We also uh, have a really robust team of dermatologists to uh, investigate um, the skin manifestations and uh, vision related issues with neuroophthalmology. For NF2, we actively treat meningioma, ependymoma, schwannomas, and we're in talks with um, uh, a drug company to initiate an NF2 um, clinical trial. We also see patients with schwannomatosis. Uh, we partner really closely with neurosurgery. Um, Dr. Grant heads up our neurosurgery um, uh, section at, um, at Stanford Children's, um, but we have a, a large team and we have a peripheral nerve uh, surgeon, TJ Wilson, who operates on both adults and um, older children with plexiform neurofibromas. Um, we have a team adjust for school-based surgeries only um, uh, that are so important in particular for NF2. Um, Juan Carlos Fernandez Miranda is a, a national or internationally renowned school-based surgeon, and he partners with Jerry Grant for these really complicated surgeries. Shannon Barris is our go-to in neuro-ophthalmology. So she's a neurologist uh, who's trained in neuro-ophthalmology, and she has a particular interest in optic pathway gliomas, as well as um, uh, looking at um, objective markers of um, a vision loss and, um, and uh, the threat of vision loss in optic pathway glioma. Um, and she sees both adults and children, but she does have more of a focus in children. Um, and she and I partner um, to have clinic on the same day so we can try to coordinate uh, patients' visits. Um, in addition, we have strong um, partnership with uh, hematology oncology um, for um, MPNSTs, pheochromocytomas, leukemias, um, and orthopedics um, for the scoliosis and skeletal dysplasias. We also, uh, as I said, have uh, dermatology as well as plastic surgery, cardiology, oral maxillofacial um, surgery, interventional radiology, psychiatry, endocrinology, general surgery, audiology, and rehab services. I wanted to um, spend just a minute to talk about our rehab services. So as part of um, our speech and language um, pathology offerings, we do cognitive rehab, um, and this is one of our rehab centers. Um, and um, so if, if that's an area of interest for you, please do reach out uh, to talk about that. In addition, we have a support group for families with NF. This is led by a lovely team, um, uh, Marsha and Matt Sterling, who I believe are, um, are on this um, webinar as well. And um, this happens quarterly. You do not have to be part of our Stanford clinic to join this. Right now it's virtual, so it's really open to all of you to participate. The next um, virtual uh, uh, support group will be in August. Um, and then followed in December. I'll be joining in December to talk about, um, to try to answer any questions you might have about medical issues and reference to your um, loved ones. Um, my study looking at um, neuroimaging correlates of neurocognition is ac active and enrolling. We're looking at children ages three to 18 with a diagnosis of NF. Um, and uh, my study is looking at just screening neurocognition. Dr. Tamar will be talking, I'm sorry, Dr. Green will be talking a little bit more about her study, which has a, a, a more robust battery of neurocognitive testing. Um, but if you're interested in this, please do reach out. Um, our phone number is here, um, and you, uh, you can find my email uh, on Stanford's uh, website as well. So in order to see us, um, just have your pediatrician put in a referral um, to the Stanford Children's Referral Line. All of the insurance information, all of that will be run at that time and we can work with you um, if there are difficulties. We do have a coordinator for our new patient visits who uh, will work closely with you and your pediatrician. Um, and I wanted to make sure I answered Debbie's question. So, um, we, um, we have a patient coordinator who can help with insurance issues, with prior offs, paperwork, et cetera. And um, I always want, she also mentioned we should talk about routine MRIs. 
And Gabby, that is a loaded question. Um, it's a really nuanced question to talk about screening uh, MRIs prior to any um, symptomatology. And if you're interested in that, if you want to talk about that, I would recommend coming and chatting with us because it is a nuanced um, talk and we don't have time today to get into all of it. Um, so it, it may be right for your loved one, um, depending on certain genetic uh, aberrations or a specific genetic mutation. And it also may not be in your child's best interest. So please do come and talk to us about it. We would love to chat. Um, in addition, um, just go ahead and have your pediatrician refer to Stanford Children's NF uh, Center, either myself or Dr. Stevenson, and we coordinate uh, really nicely to figure out which person each child should see. And then we act as the quarterback um, in, in guiding your child's care and, and other subspecialty services. So um, just reach out if you have any questions. And then again, I have the privilege to talk about our adult NF center, um, which is a standalone uh, adult center. Um, it is um, housed in our Stanford Neuroscience Health Center, which is a state-of-the-art facility with its own imaging in, um, uh, in the standalone building, as well as um, conference rooms for when we can all get together again. Um, there are patient-centered conferences housed um, there. It's, it's a really beautiful facility. And our NF um, center is uh, run through the Division of Neuromuscular Medicine. Dr. Jacinda Sampson heads up the, she directs the Stanford Adult NF uh, Clinic, and she specializes in neurogenetics and neuromuscular medicine, but she um, has particular interest in NF1 as well. And Sarada Sakamuri also sees our patients with NF, um, and she um, sees mostly adult patients, but she is a specialist in um, ultrasound, in particular muscle ultrasound, and so she sees our patients who um, require uh, ultrasound, our pediatric patients who require ultrasound as well. Um, TJ Wilson, I mentioned he's an adult neurosurgeon, but he specializes in uh, peripheral nerve surgery and he does um, operate on children as well. Um, and so that's what I have. Um, we would be delighted to um, answer any questions you have via email or phone call. We'd be happy to see you. Um, just reach out to us if you have any questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. We have Tamar Green and Tammy. Tiger, um, here for the NF study at Stanford. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting us. And it is our first steps in the, the um, NF1 world. So uh, I'm going to introduce myself, introduce our study, but truly looking forward to um, learning uh, from every one of you. Um, so I have two hats in my one hat. I'm a child psychiatrist and um, who uh, in the past 10 years been focusing on taking care of kids with genetic condition, not specifically NF1, but uh, a variety of genetic condition like 22Q deletion syndrome, Williams syndrome, fragile X, Turner, Kleinfenter. And in the past um, four years, I've been focusing on rhizopathies, which is the big, bigger family that NF1 belongs to. Um, I got funded to study Noonan syndrome, and uh, my mentor is here, David Stevenson, um, uh, who is a mentor on this uh, on this study. Um, and through that, I started to get more and more interested in uh, NF1. And we, as Dr. Kampman uh, mentioned, we just got funded to also study NF1. So why are we interested in that? Uh, many of the kids with NF1 and Unan syndrome uh, present with attention issues, what we might sometimes call ADHD. And they also uh, present with social skills and deficits and which sometimes uh, being uh, diagnosed as autism. Um, other than that, we're seeing learning difficulties um, or learning differences. So um, we are on the capacity of the, uh, on, on the clinical aspect, very interested in seeing the kids um, and helping with those um, aspects of care. And from the research perspective, um, we are, we're launching a new study to, to look at the brain of children with uh, NF1. And the main premise is to understand the underlying mechanism for those conditions that I just mentioned. 
I'm going to share. Um, I'm going to first introduce uh, Tammy, who is a research coordinator and a nutritionist uh, in her uh, training. And um, she's going to, you want to say hi? Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Good to be here. <laughs> and um, she's going to be the, the face when you communicate with us. Um, so I'm going to share the flyer of our study um, really quickly. Um, so we, what do we do? We, you come to us to Stanford, we do an MRI brain scan. It takes a, a while, an hour and a half of a scan, but we are very well training scanning kids, even very young as four or five. Um, we do, uh, as um, Dr. Chapman mentioned, do a comprehensive neurological uh, evaluation, which also include um, psychiatric uh, evaluation. Um, and uh, we're looking for boys and girls age five to 13 who have a, who has an F1. And, and we do provide um, a report summary of uh, the results of our neuropsychological evaluation. It is a research uh, one, but um, we do provide that. And uh, we do also cover all travel costs and give honorarium um, for the time that you guys spent with us. Uh, and we will distribute this uh, around. And um, about clinical services, um, I'm just, I, I've been working with David uh, for a while and starting to work with Cynthia. Um, we, we currently, the referral goes through them to, to me and um, we're doing every effort to see kids who are referred to us within a reasonable time frame. So um, I'm looking forward to join this group. Thank you. I muted myself, I forgot to unmute, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'd like to introduce UC Davis. Good morning. Good morning. See if I can get my slideshow started here. Oops. Sorry, <laughs> having issues here. Okay, good morning. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I would like to thank uh, NF California as well as the NF Network uh, for the chance to share a little bit about uh, the UC Davis NF RAS Pathway Clinic this morning. My name is, oops, excuse me. My name is Leanne Higa and I am a genetic counselor. Uh, with our uh, division. So we see both children and adults and we are located in genomic medicine at the MIND Institute. Um, although we don't uh, necessarily offer uh, same day appointments where you may see multiple specialties on one day, uh, we do have very close working relationships with other specialties, including neurology, cardiology, ophthalmology, dermatology, hematology, oncology, physical medicine and rehabilitation, as well as pain medicine. One thing to know is that these uh, other specialties are located at other UC Davis sites. So if you choose, you may opt to coordinate uh, multiple specialist visits on one day. Um, for most patients and families, this works out best to do two specialties on a single day. Our clinical team consists of um, our director, Suma Shankar, as well as our five genetic counselors. We are fortunate enough to be located at the MIND Institute. So if you are a parent uh, looking for uh, care for your child, we have many amenities. Uh, I've shown here a picture of our outdoor space, which includes a playground, which has just reopened, and we do have precautions to keep everyone safe. 
In addition, we have a child life uh, program, which offers a toy library for your child's enjoyment during their visit. We also have uh, pre-visit tours that can be arranged if you think this would be helpful for your child to get a sense of what a visit could mean. And I've listed here uh, the Child Life Program website, as well as included a QR code in the upper right corner uh, for you to visit that page if you're interested. They also have a wonderful video about preparing your child for their visit as well. Here at the Mind Institute, uh, we see a lot of children with uh, autism and sensory processing disorders. So we also have a vitals uh, station that is specially equipped uh, with uh, sensory objects to help make this process a little less stressful for your child. In addition, we have language interpretation that is available by iPad. And before your visit, uh, you can uh, consider sending us any additional testing or records that were not uh, done at UC Davis. Uh, most, the most helpful things for us to receive include genetic testing results, as well as provider notes from specialists, including genetics, genetics neurology, oncology, et cetera, as well as the results of any imaging, such as MRIs and ultrasounds. At your visit, you will be seen by both a genetic counselor and a geneticist. We will review your medical history and family history in detail, and Dr. Shankar will provide a physical exam. You will receive genetic counseling, including a discussion of genetic testing options. And also you will receive at the end of the visit, tailored recommendations and referrals. Our, typic, our typical visit lasts uh, one and a half to two hours. And about a week after the visit, you as well as all of your providers will receive a copy of the consult note. I've listed here some common questions uh, to answer um, because I know uh, this can be helpful in um, making your decision. Um, so the first is, are clinical trials available? Uh, currently, with uh, collaboration with adult hematology and oncology, we are running uh, the Cose Lugo trial in adults for plexiform neurofibromas. We do plan to have more clinical trials in the future. Our philosophy towards routine MRI is that in general, uh, it's not recommended and we uh, order imaging as needed. Our clinic is held on the first and third Thursday afternoons of the month. And we do have a three to six month wait list. So please call well in advance for an appointment. We are offering uh, both in-person visits as well as telehealth appointments. To make an appointment, please request a referral from your uh, primary care physician or another subspecialty provider. We accept most national insurances, including uh, TRICARE, Medi-Cal, and Medicare. And our scheduling team uh, handles referrals as well as can assist if your insurance is out of network. Uh, for uh, individuals who don't have insurance, we also have self-pay options. So I've listed here our contact information with our website at the top. Uh, you may also access our website through the QR code. And for referrals, uh, you have two options. Uh, those may be sent or done by telephone by calling our UC Davis Physician Referral Center at 800 UC Davis, option three, or they may also be submitted online uh, through the electronic referral form found at that, that address. Thank you so much for uh, your time and attention this morning and this opportunity and uh, happy NF Awareness Month to everyone. Thank you so much. I have a quick question, Dr. Stevenson. Did you wanna show a couple slides before we move on to Kaiser?
Debbie, I had all his slides. He okay, went. okay. I just wanted to make sure because me and Katie were talking, we're like, did we skip over? And so I wanted to make sure we went back if we needed to. So perfect. Thank you. I would like to introduce um, our Kaiser group. Um, Heather, I don't know who's on this morning for Kaiser. I think Dr. Tezcan's here with me. Okay, perfect. Say hi. Hi, I'm okay. Heather. I am the nurse coordinator for the adult NF program at Kaiser. Um, and right now I'm actually covering the pediatric program as well since our pediatric coordinator is retired. Um, we take care of NF patients, NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis for all of Northern California. Um, and we have both, like you said, a pediatric and adult clinic. Um, our clinics are fairly similar. They're both case management model primarily. And then we run four clinics. Each program runs four clinics a year with um, multi-specialty um, pediatrics, we have pediatric neurology, genetics, developmental peds, ortho, OT, PT, medical social work, um, speech therapy, registered dietitian, and nursing. And our adult clinic has um, genetics, neurosurgery, neurology, plastics, PT, OT, social work, and nutrition as well. Um, we were doing a selumetinib trial for adults, but then once it became FDA approved for pediatrics, we um, are now just able to prescribe it off label. So our adult patients are able to get access selumetinib. Um, and we see, we were seeing during uh, COVID, we were able to see our patients virtually, but now our pediatric clinic, we're gonna start back up seeing patients again next week. Dr. Tess, can you have anything you wanna add to that? No, um, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yes, I am sorry. We are, we are not as prepared as the initial presentations because I just find out about, found out about it yesterday. But this is excellent. Uh, uh, but we are we don't have any research programs going on for our NF patients at the moment. Uh, but we are more than happy to. Uh, share the information that I just found out about uh, these centers. And, and uh, my question is, are our are, are patients open, uh, able to enter these studies um, uh, as Kaiser members? That's I, the question I, I yeah. was having. Because I was saying like, am I gonna, I have many uh, patients yeah. in that age group, many. Um, so. For UCSF, for our treatment clinical trials, we are able to, to see Kaiser patients. And we actually have a really, have had really good working relationships with many of the Kaiser providers in our neural oncology program. Um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Kim um, at Kaiser Oakland and then some of the other Kaisers as well. So yes, we, we can take Kaiser patients. I think that they have, they can only come if they, um, to be considered for a trial, right? But that they can be treated on a trial. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So sometimes yeah. what happens is this is very, very helpful. Uh, sometimes what happens is the patient thinks their care is getting transferred to UCSF. And then we say, no, Kaiser, we have a great program. Uh, right. It's just, but the research is phenomenal and we need so, so much of this information. So, right. Thank we you tell families that. that we partner with Kaiser, right? And that, that mm -hmm. obviously they're just coming to us for the, for the trial and then that they would go back to Kaiser after that. And sometimes even during, depending on what, you know, what's, what's needed. And, and I think um, Cynthia was also going to comment on. Yeah, we, we have a long history of partnering with John Kim in neuro-oncology at Stanford mm -hmm. um, for uh, clinical trials. And again, once the trial is over, the patient returns to Kaiser um, and we're not interested in taking anyone's patients from them, um, but just wanted to be able to provide um, new opportunities for treatment for folks. Excellent. So I'm available if any you know, patients or anyone wants to contact me. I'm always here as a resource for any of our patients. Um, and I can give my phone number in the chat if that works. That'd be great if you can put your phone number in there. That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll catch it and we'll post it on the after um, stuff too, the after notes. Great. Thank you. Dr. Rosser, I believe you're on. Um, I'm there. Let okay, perfect. <laughs> figure out how to share my screen here. 
All right. Well, I would like to introduce um, CHLA. We're um, kind of ahead of schedule a little bit for Northern California, but I think what we're going to do is just keep moving through the speakers. And then if we do have time for Q&A, if you, um, any of the attendees want to um, type in questions on the chat, we weren't going to really open it up for Q&A because we didn't want it to run um, a long time. But if we do have time at the end, we can address some of the questions and then we will address the questions either in emails or um, after notes. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rosser. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys so, so much for inviting me. And I agree with the other speakers. This really is a unique opportunity to sort of share um, the ways in which our, um, you know, uh, programs are helping the NF community, and I really am also glad to see that there's so many other programs out there, and it's really interesting to hear what other folks are doing. Um, so we have been here since 2005 when, um, oops, sorry, when I arrived from D.C. I'm trying to get the thing off the top. I'm sorry. Sorry if you can't see the top line there. But anyway, so we opened our clinic back in 2005. Um, here's a very old photo from 2006 that I was able to unearth. Um, and when we opened the clinic, the mission has really been to provide excellent multidisciplinary clinical care to children with NF, in addition to providing research and clinical trial opportunities. Um, our team mostly involves medical genetics and neurology as the primary sort of go-to service to coordinate care for kids. Um, Dr. Randolph has been the co-director of the clinic with me for the entirety of our um, existence here. So she sees patients on Monday afternoons with a genetic counselor. And then in neurology, um, I've been running the clinic for many years. And then Vijay Vishwanath, who ran an NF clinic in Albany, New York, um, joined us about two years ago. So he's really expanded our ability to see patients quickly, which has been great and been an integral part of our team. Um, we also have a nurse practitioner, Kelly Powers, who's um, joined our team over the last year. And she's been great. She's starting to see patients independently too, which is one wonderful and participate in all our activities. And uh, for the duration of our clinic, we've always had a very strong NF coordinator who's usually a nurse um, to help us out. From the old picture, I put the old picture here too, because there's me and Dr. Randolph, but also Kathy was our um, clinic coordinator before and Aaron was one of our genetic counselors. So we have some different people in those places today, but those are all strong members of our team. Um, we see patients with NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis. Um, we see about 400 patients per year. Um, as you probably know, most of these are um, children, usually under 21, but we do see a limited number of young adults. Um, I know Leah will be presenting the program with UCLA, and we do try to transition um, some of the young adults over there, but sometimes it's hard based on insurance. So I actually do follow a nice group of 20 and sometimes 30-year-olds um, you know, generally when they're uncomplicated and just need a check in so that I can help coordinate their care and make sure they're getting what they need. Um, CHLA really accepts all insurances. So um, we have open arms as far as that goes. It's generally not too tough to coordinate, um, you know, with your insurance company. And obviously we collaborate really closely with UCLA and our colleagues at USC to transfer adult patients. Um, and I've put the uh, website address here um, for the NF clinic and also how to refer a patient. We do have centralized scheduling. Um, it does get a little confusing sometimes whether you're referring to neurology or to genetics, but both work. And um, depending on what the patient needs, we sort of triage the patients and may send them one way or another, um, you know, based on based on their presentation. So um, like the other clinics, you know, we really have um, multidisciplinary services available. We generally do not see patients all in one space at one time, but it's a really cl close network of other providers who we can refer to. We communicate all the time. We do a multidisciplinary um, tumor board conference every Tuesday morning, um, which always involves neurosurgery, neuro-oncology, neuroradiology, neuropathology, and neurology, among some other services, um, where we coordinate care for our patients. And then when we need to loop in off the Ophthalmology or orthopedics um, or other services, we certainly do that at that time so that we make sure we're all making uh, working really closely together to provide excellent patient care. So for our NF patients, um, we have the whole gamut of genetics, neurology, ophthalmology, orthopedics, neuro-oncology, general oncology for um, sarcoma patients, um, endocrinology, nephrology when patients have hypertension or other um, kidney issues, neurosurgery, general surgery, plastic surgery. Um, we have a special pain 
Wayne Clinic, where we, um, you know, have the availability to treat kids with, um, you know, non-medicinal treatments like biofeedback and massage and uh, supportive care with social work and a psychologist. Um, dermatology actually refers a lot of patients to us and participates with our patient care. Um, we have a new behavioral health center, which is opened and has really expanded our ability to provide um, psychological and psychiatric support to kids, as well as um, more developmental pediatricians to help with ADHD and learning issues. Um, and then we have a really strong cadre of social workers in neurology that help um, our families as well. So as you probably know, NF2 is much more rare in children with NF1 and, uh, than in children um, than NF1. Um, and they may have different presentations. So I think what they need in the adult world may be a little bit different than what they need in pediatrics. But again, we have a strong team of genetics, neurology, ENT, audiology, ophthalmology, neurosurgery, neuro-oncology, orthopedics, plastic surgery, um, again, pain and social work. I did not put schwannomatosis up here um, because it's primarily an adult disorder. Um, over the years, I have seen schwannomatosis patients who generally come um, just to see an NF specialist and really to kind of get set on the right path pathway, um, but we really don't see a lot of uh, schwannomatosis patients, so I did not put that on there. Um, in April, we opened our big, beautiful new Neurological Institute, which is a shared space with neurology and neurosurgery. We're really proud of this. We have 33 exam rooms. Um, we do all of our EEGs for our epilepsy patients on the same floor. And just this past week, I was able to um, go see a patient collaboratively with our NF, uh, with um, an NF2 patient with our neurosurgeon, Dr. Krieger. And it was great. We both collaborated. We looked at the scans together. We made a decision to um, start her on a Vastin with our neuro-oncologist and um, she needed surgery on her cervical spine. And so she's going to have all of that. And we were able to all stand in one room and discuss her care, which was great. Um, as you probably know, um, we are part of the DOD NF consortium. Um, I put the map up here because um, Los Angeles is the one and only site on the West Coast. Hopefully that will be expanding over the years. Um, Utah is the next closest site and um, we participate in all the DOD um, NF consortium studies. And Leah will talk because this is a collaborative effort between CHLA and UCLA. And fortunately this year we've opened our first uh, clinical trial at UCLA, which Leah will talk about. Um, you know, the goal of the NF consortium is to provide multi um, to provide uh, multi-center clinical trial opportunities for patients with a variety of complications, primarily with NF1 and NF2, although there will be trials coming down the pipeline for schwannomatosis. Um, you know, the focus is really on plexiform, skeletal abnormalities, the gliomas, both in the visual pathway and in other places in the brain, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. We have not opened um, the clinical trials here for the MPNSTs, primarily because this tends to be uh, more of an adult condition. Um, but, uh, but there are other places where patients can go to participate in those. Um, we've participated in neurocognitive studies, and then Leah um, has opened the NF2 study over there. And obviously, we work really closely with our um, you know, colleagues throughout the consortium. Um, I won't belabor these, but these are available on um, the DOD website. We are about to open the poly ICLC um, study for progressive uh, low-grade gliomas in kids and adults with NF1. Um, we participate in the benametinib study for plexiforms and also the cabozatinib study for plexiforms. Um, also coming down the pipeline is a new neurocognitive study, which we anticipate we'll participate in. This is looking at guanfacine and the treatment of kids with ADHD and neurocognitive deficits. Um, this protocol is still in development, but should be hopefully open in the next year or so. So we're really excited about that and hope we can recruit a lot of patients. Um, also, we have other clinical trials that we participate in that are not part of the, um, and, and research studies that are not part of the uh, consortium. Um, like uh, Cynthia said, the Springs Work Meritometinib study for plexiforms is open here. Also, for many years, we participated in um, a neurocognitive study from DC Children's. That is uh, finally wrapping up, but that's looking at working memory and cognitive deficits in kids with NF1. Um, and then also, like Stanford, we're participating in the natural history optic path glioma study that um, comes from Philadelphia at the Children's Hospital there. So it really is a full gamut and we're super happy to take care of anybody that needs it. Um, you know, just reach out to us if you need help and we're happy to help coordinate appointments or answer any questions. Okay, I think that's all I had to say, Debbie. Perfect, thank you so much. I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Panosian. 
Great, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Rosser, very nicely done. Uh, my name is Dr. Panosian, and I'm gonna load up my slides here. I'm located in Pasadena, California. And in just a second, oops, there we go. Oh, I gotta share my screen, sorry. Here we go. All right, excellent. So I'm just gonna be talking about uh, neurofibromatosis at my practice today, specifically to answer some of these questions. Everyone can see these slides, right? Okay. All right, so I am located in Pasadena, California. I've uh, been in Southern California for about, oh gosh, 20 plus years after residency and uh, uh, well, part of my practice obviously is largely going to be due to, uh, is going to treat the issue with uh, neurofibromatosis. So about my practice. So plastic surgery, just to answer some of those pre-screened uh, questions, uh, my practice is a plastic surgery practice. I specialize or subspecialize in pediatric plastic surgery, which is how I sort of got my start in the world of neurofibromatosis at Children's Hospital Los Angeles with Dr. Rosser and the gang over there. Um, we uh, are obviously surgically oriented. We're not, I'm not, I don't have a multidisciplinary practice in that sense, but we do have a local referral network that we use between Children's Hospital and, and uh, Cedars and uh, various other hospitals in the region. Uh, I treat all ages. Uh, basically, we do NF1, NF2, schwannomatosis, all of the peripheral nerve issues that can result from neurofibromatosis will treat. What I don't treat are things related to um, uh, intra-abdominal or intraspinal, intracerebral, in the major cavities of the body where there are subspecialists that uh, are more um, uh, ready to do those types of procedures. Uh, those will be done by them. However, everything else, any tumor, no matter how small or large, I will remove and even from deep compartments within the extremities, for example. Uh, I do treat NF2. I do not treat the central uh, lesions of NF2. I do treat the uh, cranial nerve tumors that can result uh, from this, such as with the facial nerve or the trigeminal nerve um, that can give you sensation issues in the face. Uh, as far as the MRI requirements, I, we go case by case on this, really. I don't routinely get MRIs on everyone. Um, it's sort of a symptoms-based approach. Uh, in the sense that uh, if, if we're trying to set up for surgery, there's two real re questions we're trying to ask. One is that, do we have any critical brain masses present that might be an issue during general anesthesia? And in some cases, that is uh, the case. Now, sometimes these, are, uh, these may be asymptomatic uh, brain tumors that may be critical in nature. However, more often these are going to be symptomatic in some way, issues with balance, vision, hearing, um, uh, sort of central uh, brainstem types of symptoms that will uh, prompt us to get MRIs of the brain to rule out these sort of masses. Uh, as far as the location we're treating, I don't get MRIs routinely at all for the places I'm treating, whether it's on the uh, large plexiform tumors on the face or the legs uh, or arms, it, it really kind of comes down to um, what am I trying to see with that MRI in terms of uh, planning. A lot of times the NF tumors are located mostly in the skin and the subcutaneous or the under the skin tissues where you have all the fat and down even through the muscle sometimes. Uh, occasionally, more rarely, we go through the muscle and into uh, larger lesions that are located along the major peripheral nerves like the sciatic nerve, for example, uh, in, the, uh, in the leg area. Uh, those are um, obviously more common in other types of conditions like schwannomatosis where we see those, uh, but they can happen in NF1 as well. Um, as far as clinical research, I do participate in clinical research. We've been uh, doing research with UCLA. Uh, we also have a group out of Syracuse that we're uh, in the planning stages of a new project uh, looking at different uh, interventional options related to medications that might slow the progress or stop the progress or, or stop the growth of uh, NF tumor specifically. Um, 
as far as insurance is accepted, I am technically what's called out of network with all insurance providers. Uh, that does not mean we don't accept insurance. We usually tap into what's called the out of network tier within these insurance groups. Um, this is more in line with what we call PPO types or indemnity plan uh, insurance companies. HMOs are a lot more restrictive in that regard um, as, and uh, so is Medi-Cal, Medicaid um, and Medicare as well. So I don't participate in the latter ones, but I do participate as an out of network provider with a lot of these PPO uh, uh, plans like Blue Cross or Blue Shield, Aetna, Cigna, United, all of those uh, will happen. Now, sometimes in, in some instances, there are various versions of these plans and even in HMO plans, there's always this mechanism to go out of the network to see a specialist for a specific condition or a specific treatment that is not offered by anybody in the network of doctors that they have. And so that uh, terminology is often called a gap exception. And that is a good term to remember if you're uh, trying to get in, uh, insurance coverage uh, for someone who is out of network, you, and this is someone who's providing a special service that is not that is not available in the network, then there's this mechanism uh, that you can proceed. You have to kind of be persistent with it. Uh, insurance companies don't like to grant it. It essentially allows you as the patient to go to someone like myself who is an out of network provider as if I am an in network provider. And uh, in essence, you're, you tap into the in network uh, benefits plan. So. I have my practice manager who's a lot more versed in this than I am, and her name is Amber. And uh, when you call uh, to request any information about surgical uh, scheduling or insurance questions, you'll be talking to Amber. And she's very knowledgeable in this regard about how to go about getting things like gap exceptions and medical necessity letters and things like that uh, to make these insurance companies uh, do what's right and, and pay for these types of procedures instead of calling them cosmetic as they often like to do. Uh, the types of tumors I treat are plexiform and dermal or cutaneous types of tumors for the most part. And these are in relation most often to NF1. Um, I don't really do a lot of these types of tumor excisions, which is gliomas, spinal tumors, or MPNSTs. Uh, although I, I have removed MPNSTs, they are obviously quite rare. And uh, they do require a multidisciplinary team approach with an oncologist as well. Um, but the, the other central tumors, uh, like I said before, are, are areas that I do not treat. So um, it's often important to understand that this is not, you, you know, and neurofibroma tumors are not like any other tumors. They have different features that make them more challenging, in fact, than other tumors. Yes, the vast majority are benign. However, uh, they have some characteristics that are very aggressive and, um, and require some attention. So. Uh, oftentimes we'll see a lot of bleeding associated with uh, large plexiform tumors like this, uh, this one on this uh, young lady. Um, and we have to plan for that, things like blood transfusions and, and uh, uh, pre-donation of blood is an, uh, is an option whenever we see someone like this. In a lot of cases, I don't even get an MRI when I see something like this anymore because honestly, we're not trying to remove the entirety of the tumor. That is an impossibility that is incredibly disfiguring and not compatible a lot of times with life. Instead, what we uh, do is to limit the burden of tumor more so than, than to um, uh, eliminate the tumor altogether, which means that it's not a cure. In other words, there is some tumor left behind, that tumor can grow. And therefore that may need to be addressed in the future with another type of surgery to debulk or limit the size of these tumors. We wanna preserve nerve function whenever possible uh, such as the facial nerve in this case, sometimes we cannot because it is so infiltrative and so um, ill-defined that the uh, separation between the normal tissues and tumor is very hard to see. Um, the other issue is that when you see something like this, we're, we're, we're dealing with a large tumor, we don't know where to stop a lot of times. We have to know where to stop. We can't just keep going and going and going until we see normal tissues and all on all fronts, it's just not a, 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 it's very disfiguring. And again, like I said, it's not a very safe thing to do. Uh, we have to therefore define the goal of surgery. In other words, staging these types of surgeries, we take out, an, for example, an area of this tumor, for example, would be targeted first. And we would wanna get that healed before we jump to the 
uh, a forehead, for example. These are the considerations that I make whenever I deal with uh, someone with neurofibromatosis. So when to consider surgery, this is where the insurance companies really wanna see this. What are the symptoms? Why, why remove any of these? These are benign. Why are you trying to remove them no matter how big or small? And the answer is that they, they cause these issues. These are the symptoms of neurofibromatosis. They can be large and disfiguring. They can cause pain frequently on a daily basis, whether it's with wearing of clothes or height, heightened sensitivity, where, for example, leaning against a chair or a car seat. These things uh, have an impact on your activities of daily living and, or, or, and quality of life. Uh, and they may impair your ability to go to work and uh, uh, function in society and therefore this, these symptoms are very important to highlight uh, in order to get insurance companies to understand, okay, yes, all right, then we have symptoms, therefore it goes beyond cosmetic, for example. Uh, the other question we have to ask, are the scars worth it? In some cases they are, in some cases they are not. Um, one of the examples is doing electrodesiccation, which I'll describe later, um, on large lesions. If, it, if these lesions are too big and you're, you're cauterizing them, essentially you're creating a burn on the skin and that burn can have a large scar plaque associated with it. And oftentimes they're raised almost just like the tumor and in some cases worse than the tumor itself. So we have to always understand what, what are the limitations of any of these interventions we're doing and what's the trade-off or the cost uh, associated with any one of those. And then the other question again is like we, I was alluding to before, neurofibromatosis, still we don't have a proper cure for this. We have therapeutics and surgery. And so surgery is often going to have to repeat, be repeated over the course of a lifetime, just depending on rate of progress of the, of the condition. So if, if it's a large tumor on the face, we've debulked it, it can grow again. Does it grow again? Not always, and therefore we don't know if we need one surgery or 10 surgeries sometimes when, when we're dealing with a large plexiform tumor uh, like that. Uh, the other question, which I think is a really important one is will early intervention make a difference? And I think that is the, that, that right there is my sort of public service announcement is that yes, anytime you can remove a tumor that is smaller and prevent its growth, that's gonna get, put you ahead both in terms of the complexity of the reconstruction that's required or the or limitation of the scar that's going to be required to remove that actual tumor. So I'm a big fan of interventions that will lead to earlier and earlier treatment to prevent these tumors from forming in the first place. And I have a, a few different things that I do in my practice to help with that. Uh, so just a quick example, this is like a, we were talking about giant uh, plexiform uh, neurofibroma, it's causing skin changes and laxity of skin. And so we, we essentially have to plan these things out. This is, these are how big the skin excisions are. It's all the way over towards there and it's all the way here. These are, these are pretty big excisions. And, um, and when we do those, we're able to eliminate a lot of it. Of course, there's still some changes here happening on the leg, for example, on the outer part of the leg that still have tumor associated with it. And that part may need to be addressed down the road. But in the meantime, we have started the process of limiting the size of these tumors and therefore making them more manageable with little tiny revisions as we move forward. And that, that could be every year, it could be every 10 years. We, we, at least uh, we have uh, a smaller lesion to uh, follow. Just a, a few quick examples. These are, I've sort of seen, shown these in previous symposia. But uh, these, they could be small and self-limited like that, where you can kind of remove it and then get a decent effect out of, out of that type of a tumor resection. Uh, these are some other locations of tumors. This is located in the inner part of the eye and it's causing a droop and we have to remove that and correct the droop simultaneously. These types of tumors are a little bit more self-limited um, uh, and well encapsulated and therefore don't require as much uh, of dissection or, and, and they are actually much more defined and therefore you can remove it all in one session. Uh, here's a plexiform tumor. We're showing him at five years post-op and he's shown a very nice, excellent result. There's a scar across the eyebrow. There's a scar up the eyebrow and he's got a good repositioning of the eyebrow itself. Very happy patient. And you can see he still got the function because we didn't damage his facial nerve in the process. And that sort of highlights the, the underlying uh, theme of a lot of these neurofibromas is that they don't like to invade 
motor nerves, which is great, I think. However, they, they, they can sometimes infiltrate them in some way or come really close to them and affect their function. And so when we remove this, we're trying to very hard not to damage that nerve. And just another example, and this is the staging concept where this, this gentleman has it all throughout the arm and into the palm, but of course that would be much too uh, aggressive of a surgery to take on all at once. And so we stage it where we take off the lump at the wrist first, and then we come back and we remove the rest of the palmar mass that's there. Now, again, there's tumor left in there. We need to follow him into the future and, and remove that. Now, when I see something like this, I know this is gonna come out in one piece really quickly. This takes about 15 minutes, believe it or not, to do because I know that it's well encapsulated and it doesn't need a giant incision down the arm. It just, honestly, it's a little teeny incision. You can kind of get a sense for it from here to here. And that is less than the long axis of that tumor that I'm removing. And it just sort of pops out like a, you know, a little perfect little marble or something like that. So I just, I just put this up here to show that M MPNSTs do happen. This is along a major peripheral nerve. And these, this patient had a recurrent case of it and we went in after that. I just sort of put that up to uh, show that. Now these are excisions of larger cutaneous tumors. These are not really amenable to electrodesiccation purely. And so this is several sessions of large volume excisions that I do to just remove them in rapid fashion as, as much as possible so that we get some relief out of the tumors. Now, of course, the scars that are left behind are sometimes not ideal. However, again, it's a trade-off between the contour problem that is caused by the tumor versus a flat, but maybe not so fantastic looking scar. So that leads me into the electrodesiccation. This applies more to the adult population and not so much the uh, children's population. And, and honestly, I hadn't seen this really until I went into private practice and I started dealing with the adult population of NF and started seeing a lot of these dermal tumors start to pop up. And I use a device called the Hyfricator and you can you know, there's other devices out there, the uh, uh, Bovi and all these other things with a needle tip probe. And we essentially take these smaller ones and we zap them in rapid fashion and go all over the defined area that we're treating. Uh, and again, trading these for scars. Now, again, the larger you get on these tumors, the bigger the scar that will remain. And sometimes that scar is not so great and it can be raised. And instead those might be more amenable to cutting out. Okay, so limitations again is the scar from the electrodesiccation. Sometimes is if you if you apply it to large tumors, it's not ideal. Uh, sometimes we get incomplete removal of the deep tumor. So when we're doing electrodesiccation, sometimes the tumor is literally in the skin, and sometimes it's sort of the tip of an iceberg. And so electrodesiccation doesn't sometimes get that deep root of that tumor, which can subsequently grow. Uh, and so if that happens, we retreat it or we re-excise it at that time. We may need to retreat like, for that reason. Um, and again, I, I, I sort of cap it at about five millimeters in diameter as far as what's amenable to electrodesiccation and what's acceptable. Why does this matter? It's because if it's larger than that, then I will excise. If I'm excising more of them during surgery than I am doing electrodesiccation, then we limit the territory that we are treating at any given surgery. And, uh, and I'm, like I said, we combine it with traditional excision. So my technique that I often will counsel patients on is that we need to determine what areas are we treating. We can't do the whole body in one session of surgery um, because it's too much. It's too much wound. Uh, in other words, we're, when we apply the electrodesiccation or the excisions, we are either putting an incision or a tiny burn mark that will need to heal. And if that does not heal properly, then what can happen is that, um, uh, what can happen is, is that your body will then either make a poor scar or it will have a hard time healing it in a timely fashion. And what's a timely fashion? It's roughly within two weeks. Uh, scars need to be fully healed within two weeks, or in other, which is to say that they're closed, no more open wounds, uh, in order to have a more quote unquote favorable scar. Uh, for that reason, I limit surgery to three hours. And that allows me to take a few hundred tumors off uh, of defined areas. And these are determined by the patient, whatever the priority is for the patient. Is it the face? Is it the neck? Is it the legs? Whatever the case may be. 
those are the areas targeted within the three hours. Um, it is an outpatient surgery. It's done under general anesthesia, and there's a good reason for that. I don't use the local when I'm doing general because uh, if we were to inject all of these little tumors, we're talking about hundreds of tiny injections, and uh, that becomes quickly uh, going to approach a toxic level of, an of anesthetic uh, when using things like lidocaine. Um, uh, the other things are basically technical in nature. It's a pretty quick procedure overall, and it's relatively easy on the recovery. Uh, we do antibiotic ointment for three to five days, and we switch to a cream for the rest of the time uh, along with sunblock. So how many sessions of this are required? It's difficult to say, honestly. It just depends on severity of the condition, um, the desires of the patient in, the, in terms of addressing trouble spots versus uh, trying to treat the whole body, for example. Uh, one of the questions I often get is, does it aggravate more growth? And the answer is likely not. I haven't seen more growth or more spur uh, or, or, or let's just say more are spurred by uh, the surgery itself. However, you know, we need to watch that and obviously look after that. I think some, some of the regrowth that we see, quote unquote, is essentially that problem that I mentioned before we, where we have a little tiny root left over and that can sort of spring up and then it looks like, oh my gosh, we got an, uh, it grew back and it grew back bigger, et cetera. But it's not really doing that necessarily it's just progression is what we usually see. However, pregnancy seems to be a very uh, common, at least anecdotally speaking, uh, trigger uh, for growth of these types of tumors. Again, early treatment's better. So whenever we can deal with someone like this, we'll get a better result in the long run than, than if we were to get someone with uh, a more aggressive version of that. So how many can be removed per session? Again, it sort of depends on the size uh, distribution. If the large ones are there and we need to cut them out, well, we, we might have to uh, you know, be happy with about a couple hundred. However, however if they're tiny and they're sort of uh, you know, clustered uh, sparsely and, and there's a lot of them, then we could do up to 800 sometimes. So sometimes uh, this me. sort of, yes. Dr. Panosian, um, your presentation is really great. We, we need to give you a two minute warning. Oh, though. sorry. We, we, okay, were, we were ahead of schedule. Now we want to stay on schedule. Thank you. Good, good. That's what I was waiting for. Good. So I'll just show this here. It's just basically shows the severity conditions and what's needed as we get further. Just a couple of follow ups 19 months out. Uh, this is what you can do with that combined surgical approach. These are, I just show this to show the scars of neurofibrom or electrodesiccation. These are flat white scars or non-pigmented scars that are the trade-off that we talk about. And in some cases, if these are too large, then of course it's not acceptable. Um, anyway, so that I'll leave it at that. Uh, any, and we can obviously go to the questions if we have time for that or, or not. We're not planning any questions right now because there are 14 or 15 speakers, but we'll really appreciate your contribution. Thank you. Absolutely, my pleasure. We'd like to um, introduce UCLA. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me on uh, to introduce our clinic at UCLA. I am Dr. Fee Wan Lia Nimfu. Uh, patients often call me Dr. Lia. I'm a neuro-oncologist and a neurologist by training. And I see mostly just adult patients with primary brain and nervous system tumors. And I've been an attending at UCLA for about 15 years, um, but our clinic in NF is relatively young. So it's really exciting to hear about all the other NF clinics that are in, are in California. We actually started a clinic in NF2 and schwannomatosis originally around 2017 when I started collaborating with Dr. Marco Giovannini in a clinical trial for NF2 patients. However, if, uh, as you've heard from Tina also, uh, with further collaboration with other institutions and CHLA and consortiums, um, we have expanded our clinic to include all patients with neurofibromatosis. Um, I do see mostly adult patients over the age of 18, but do have several pediatric oncology colleagues. And again, a very close collaboration with CHLA for transfer of patients over the age of 21. So um, I'm gonna, have a little sub slide to explain a little bit more about our neurofibromatosis program at UCLA. 
So we um, have a comprehensive NF program at this point at UCLA. Um, I am the clinical and medical director. And again, I'm from neurology and a neuro-oncologist by training. Our surgical director or neurosurgical director is Dr. Richard Everson, who is actually a pretty well-rounded neurosurgeon who is um, actually has special training in central as well as spine, as well as peripheral nerve surgery. So he can actually see patients with NF2 and NF1, also mostly adult patients. Uh, we do also have pediatric neurosurgeons who work with us very closely uh, when we need to have surgery for pediatric patients. Our scientific director is Dr. Marco Giovannini, who leads a very large basic research program. We'll see it at F2-ish ornamentosis. And if we have some time afterwards, Dr. Giovannini will talk a little bit about our basic research program also. So our program uh, philosophy is that we want to provide comprehensive multidisciplinary approach for patients with neurofibromatosis. Uh, we do have state-of-the-art imaging. We have, again, a lot of bench to bedside experts, as well as basic research and clinical trials in NF. So this is the core team for the neurofibromatosis program. Um, these are the physicians that are usually on NF tumor board with me on a monthly basis. Uh, we do have our neurotologists and facial nerve reconstruction from head and neck, uh, several neurosurgeons, including Dr. Wang, who's a pediatric neurosurgeon, a neuro-ophthalmologist who has a uh, very strong interest in NF1 and NF2 uh, patients, clinical geneticist, who's also um, pediatric neuro uh, pediatric oncology, our neuroradiologist, um, as well as researchers specifically for in the neurofibromatosis program. We do also have several, many other specialty that can treat patients with NF1 and NF2, several who have uh, worked very closely with me uh, for various patients and also a lot of other subspecialties that we can refer to at UCLA. We are also uh, really a part of the UCLA Brain Tumor Center, and that helps us take advantage of really the very, very large core team that has worked collaboratively together for only a couple of decades that we have had the Brain Tumor Center at UCLA. Um, again, a lot of us are the core part of the Brain Tumor Center, but also social work, rehab services, neuropsychology, palliative care, as well as very close collaborative work with our researchers and other specialties that care for patients with central nervous system tumors. This is a little bit about the clinic process. This is mainly involving adult patients with NF. Um, if there are pediatric patients that call in, I can refer them to our, again, our pediatric oncology group as well as coronary care with uh, CHLA. So there's kind of two different ways that patients can call in to get into our program, either the brain tumor center intake or directly to my clinic at neuro-oncology. And oftentimes patients will see me first in neuro-oncology. Um, we can also have same day visit with neurosurgery or because of COVID, we have actually been doing a lot of telemedicine visits where uh, both myself and Dr. Everson see patients concurrently on the telemedicine visit. Um, just briefly on intake, um, there is a website for UCLA that has a listing of all the insurance that gets accepted at UCLA Health. We do also accept the government program um, care, but I do know that there can be issues if um, these government program or HMOs are not contracted with UCLA, but our new patient facilitator should be able to tell you if your insurance is accepted at, our, um, at UCLA Health. And this is where my clinic is located. We're on the west side of Los Angeles um, versus CHLA, which is on the east side or really in the middle. Um, we are closer to the west side. We're actually on the south side of the whole UCLA campus. And all of our clinics are really in close proximity to each other, making it easy for same day visits. Um, my clinic as well as head and neck are in the same building. Our MRI centers are really located around us in the medical plaza, neurosurgery and neuro-ophthalmology are just across the street. 
Uh, my clinic is actually in the oncology center in the medical plaza at UCLA. And I actually have clinic, so patients with NF actually are seen together with my brain tumor patients in clinic every Wednesday, but that also helps with access because I can see most new patients within two to three weeks. Um, there is a possibility I may separate out an NF clinic in the future, but it's actually been helpful because in this way I see patients faster. Um, in my clinic, patients are also seen always by me, but also in collaboration with several of our nurse practitioners as well as neuro-oncology fellows that I train in the clinic. So once the patients enter our clinic, uh, we can develop a comprehensive plan for these patients and uh, present them at our monthly NF tumor board and uh, then can refer out to where there is to the different subspecialties or um, for treatment planning. And um, again, as a neuro-oncologist, I can also treat as well as evaluate patients, discuss clinical trials, uh, uh, plan for routine imaging. We do uh, want to have routine imaging depending on the location of symptoms as well as uh, the larger tumor. Again, in adult patients, the tumors can have either tendency for malignancies or growth and large in size. And so these patients tend to need more routine screening. We do at least annual monitoring of uh, neurologic exam, audiology, if it's an NF2 patient, brain uh, MRI of whatever um, body parts or brain or spine that may have uh, a tumor burden. We do have specialized NF1 and NF2 protocols as well as three volumetric for vestibular schwannomas built into all of our scanners at UCLA, um, annual ophthalmology exam, as well as cancer screening. Uh, we do also have a listing of various clinical trials. Again, our clinic does tend to have more NF2 and schwannomatosis trials, uh, but I do have an NF1 trial. The NF2 trials, uh, like Tina said, is part of the NF consortium, where we're a satellite -like clinic of CHLA, or together with the platform trial uh, that is sponsored by CTF into it, NF2, that is um, part of a group between us and um, Dana, MGH, Hopkins, um, University of Miami, and the Mayo Clinic. We are also um, anticipating a future schwannomatosis trial coming on, hopefully, later this year or next year. So this is the affiliation for our clinic. Again, um, a lot of trial network. Uh, that is one of our major goal at UCLA, not just in the clinical care of patients, but also the development of research and finding treatments for patients with neurofibromatosis. And this is our contact. Um, the, Simplest way is through our brain tumor center navigators who know how to get patients to my clinic as well as coordinate care with our neuro neurosurgery team. But sometimes it's perfectly reasonable to reach me directly if it becomes too difficult to call through the clinic. Um, this number below is actually directly to me. So, I want, I think we have a couple minutes if we can have Dr. Giovannini talk about a research program. Uh, yes, hello uh, everybody. It's uh, good to be here today with you all. <clears throat> I just want to mention, uh, first of all, a big thank to Dr. Nianfu for everything she's done for the uh, developing this uh, program. Uh, and uh, I just want to show you in uh, five or six slides a uh, summary of what research in the field of NF1 and NF2 and schwannomatosis means, uh, especially when it's regarding the um, therapeutic development program. So I try to share my screen here. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can yeah. see it. I Great. Uh, so this is uh, uh, this is a summary of uh, preclinical models. What are preclinical models? Are models <laughs> uh, that we use in the lab.
to study the effect of therapeutic intervention uh, in uh, animals, in cells, is isolated cells in vitro and in vivo in animals. And uh, over the years, there has been a number of uh, mouse models of NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis that have been developed. We participated and contributed to the development of several of them, mostly for NF2, and the latest one was the schwannomatosis mouse model, which is still the only mouse model, genetically engineered mouse model of schwannomatosis available. And this was published by my collaborator, Dr. Veet, in 2017. So the advantage of having these uh, model organisms, and we can use them first to understand the pathogenesis of uh, neurofibromatosis, but also for drug discovery, studies on drug efficacy, and studies on drug toxicity and safety. Um, so uh, the process goes from uh, uh, developing these animals to uh, phase one clinical trials in human for those compounds that have demonstrated efficacy and safety in animals. And then based on these preliminary results on safety in humans, we go to phase two and eventually phase three uh, clinical trials that eventually lead to the FDA approval um, for, uh, of, of a new drug for, in this case, neurofibromatosis indication. Because of the fact that neurofibromatosis are rare diseases, usually we stop the process, <coughs> process at the phase two trial because a phase three would require hundreds or thousands of patients that obviously <coughs> is not feasible, uh, especially for NF2 and schwannomatosis. And I just want to give you a timeline. How long does it take from the moment we have a hint, uh, an idea that <coughs> a drug or a target could uh, be relevant for treating the disease. We, this is the example of uh, <clears throat> the uh, process of uh, um, leading to the use of selumetinib for uh, NF1. You all have heard of um, selumetinib. And I remember we started <clears throat> back in 2004 in a collaborative grant uh, sponsored by the Department of Defense with the, my friend and colleague Nancy Ratner that eventually led to the publication of this paper, uh, giving the proof of concept that MAC inhibition uh, is um, um, efficacious method of inhibiting a neurofibromatosis tumor. And uh, this was in 2013. It took about three years to uh, this seminal publication, very important publication in the England Journal of Medicine by, uh, in a study led by Brigitte uh, Wiedemann, showing that it was the case also in patients. And then it took about four years uh, when in April 2020, selumetinib was granted a free approval for um, plexic for uh, neurofibroma in the NF1. A similar example in NF2. So we started a research program in 2008, again, sponsored by the Department of Defense. I cannot stress how important is this funding mechanism for all the labs um, working in the field and to attract new scientists to the neurofibromatosis field, and of course, to the Children's Firma Foundation for their contribution. So we published a first paper in 2014 showing that N4C inhibition could delay the growth of NF2 schwannomas. In January 2015, we published the first paper in collaboration with our, collaborator, uh, with our uh, again, friend and colleague, Michel Calamari, this in Paris, showing that this was the case also in patients where everolimus in about 50% of patients um, controls and stops the growth of uh, vestibular schwannoma. And uh, uh, later on in April 17, we showed that um, the treatment is safe up to four or five years um, of continuous drug uh, administration to control uh, those tumors. Um, so eventually now uh, there is no uh, FDA approval for Everolimus for 
uh, an F2 schwannoma, but we use it off label in specific uh, for specific indication. What is the future of the clinical model, large animal models? Because the advantage of uh, using a larger organism, and uh, we have collaborated to the first important publication of the NF1 genetic engineered um, pig that shows. Uh, most manifestations of uh, NF1, uh, such as uh, Carfeule macules, neurofibromas, tibial dysplasia, uh, etc. So, what's next? Uh, better pig models of NF1, and we are working actively uh, to uh, NF2 pig in collaboration with Adrian Watson um, at Recombinetics in uh, Minnesota. So, this is. Uh, for today, and again, thank you everybody for uh, organizing this and participating to this symposium. Thank you, Dr. Giovannini and, and Dr. Leah. Thank you very much. Now we'd like to introduce uh, Cedar Sinai. Great, thank you. Do you see one slide or do you see my um, black screen? We see one slide, Dr. Sanchez. I'll be pretty quick. Um, thank you, Debbie and the NF California for the invitation to meet with all the, the patients here in Southern California. Um, my name is Pedro Sanchez. I'm a pediatrician and medical geneticist. I've been here at Cedars for a little bit over two years, and I trained at Children's Hospital Philadelphia, spent 10 years at CHLA, know Dr. Rosser and Randolph and Dr. Panosian very well. And um, we're really trying to build up our NF1 uh, center here. Adults were previously managed by the adult oncology team who have their tumor board and review all the, uh, all the patients. And now they're transitioning to sort of a team-centered approach. We see and screen all new patients just for newborns with cavity spots. We do consultations. Um, a lot of people come from outside of California for a uh, uh, basically a, a uh, second opinion or coordination of specialty care. Um, but for complex ca cases, we do like to have um, a team approach. We see patients from birth to adulthood, and I'll show some of the numbers here. Um, we see about 150 uh, patients per year, and definitely you would expect a, a decrease during uh, COVID, and those numbers did go down a little bit, but hopefully um, now that we're seeing patients more in person, uh, they'll go back up. We do that. Those are the total 150 per year um, for all NF1 patients. For pediatric patients, we see about uh, 50 patients, um, both at diagnosis and management. For NF2, we see about 15 to 20 patients, which is not so much in the grand scheme of things, but um, that number is also growing. We're located in the middle of Los Angeles in West Hollywood. Um, when you say Cedar sinai it's part of this Cedar sinai Health Systems, which includes multiple hospitals and multiple providers. Providers could be both part of the medical group or in network for the Cedar sinai Insurance, which is the Health Associates Insurance. Um, and so um, a lot of surgeons and, and providers have privileges to do procedures here in our center but not all providers are part of the faculty of CEDARS. So we do have a coordinator, uh, care coordinator that helps get authorizations for procedures and um, referrals for the different um, imaging modalities. When you do come to CEDARS, um, it's located be right next to the Beverly Center. So some people do park at the Beverly Center to get a discounted um, parking and to shop afterwards, but it's, we're between Beverly and Third and between Robertson and San Vicente Boulevard. Um, I see patients both at the Children's Health, Center, Children's Health Center, which is the Steven Spielberg uh, building, and also at the Allied Health Science Pavilion, which is on the sixth floor um, with both neurosurgery and neuro-oncology. We try to bring patients together once a month um, and see as many providers on the same day as possible. Um, but most of the time, it's sort of an a la carte evaluation. Um, again, Brenna Steinhardt is our care coordinator and would help with um, uh, that initial evaluation. I see all patients or, or at least triage the patients when they do get referred to us. Um, we try to connect them with either a pediatric team or an adult uh, neuro-oncology team, uh, depending on their needs. Um, again, some people on this list are 
affiliated with Cedar sinai not everybody, um, and depending on the patient's preference, uh, they may do a start here, do some procedures there, come back, um, but ideally get all the imaging and um, information put in one place. I'll give a quick example of someone we just saw recently. This is a woman who has multiple small capillary spots, had a couple um, neurofibromas confirmed on pathology, on biopsy. You can see she has what looks like segmental NF. Um, we have our internal next generation sequencing lab that was able to sequence the tumor within the same week, found two pathogenic mutations that confirmed her mutation. And definitely uh, knowing the mutation is helpful, especially because she just gave birth to a little two month, a little baby, and she noticed that the baby has a cafe spot. Um, fortunately, uh, the baby does not have NF1, was mutation negative, um, at least for the mutations that, that uh, were identified in her. And um, if it was positive, we do have an infant progress clinic that will do a full um, battery of neurodevelopmental tests. We do refer to the regional, regional center for older kids. Um, part of our team includes neurology that it has uh, Dr. Tavia that does her own uh, neurodevelopmental assessments. Um, but uh, each, each provider will be uh, seen on a different day. Recently this week, we saw one adult that saw adult neuro-oncology and saw Dr. McKinnon, who is actually a plastic surgeon from Chicago. Many of you know him from um, other conferences. He has family here in Los Angeles, so he comes to Los Angeles um, once, a, once a month. And so you might see them. This patient also saw urology, saw um, dermatology, saw psychiatry. And so we were trying to coordinate everything so that the patient could um, get as many recommendations as possible before they return to um, their place of living out of the state. That patient had, his chief complaint was actually the um, eczema and uh, itchiness of the neurofibromas on his legs. So he saw both um, Dr. Garavi, who does a lot of the surgical management in-house, but also saw Allison um, Trong, who made a lot of recommendations. She's an expert on eczema and itchiness and actually was the woman that you saw pictures of earlier with the segmental NF1. So she has both that personal experience and uh, expertise. Um, the, the, the patient also saw neuro-oncology, had imaging done, and uh, Dr. Hu is um, both a neurologist and neuro-oncologist that would review all cases. Any concerns would be referred to our pediatric neurosurgery or adult neurosurgical team and we have um, other areas of expertise for different types of tumors that are seen. For plastic surgery and reconstruction, I mentioned Dr. McKay McKinnon, but also Andre is, is a close friend of mine. So I, I definitely um, share a lot of patients with him. Our pediatric uh, hematology oncology team um, sees most of our NF1 patients. Dr. Baca has a study right now that's on the clinicaltrials.gov website that includes um, full body imaging of pediatric patients looking for um, different types of signals um, and changes that might give a clue of, of what might be transitional um, from pre-malignant tumors. Um, she's recruiting patients between five and 18 and um, she'll see them over multiple visits and um, will screen patients whether or not they're candidates for this type of of study. Any adults will be seen, any adult women will be referred to our breast cancer program. We do have a high risk breast cancer um, service, which is coordinated by a nurse practitioner, Sherry Goldman and um, Riva Basho. They will, they do do uh, routine imaging, both uh, um, mammograms and alternating between mammogram and uh, um, breast MRI. We take all types of insurance. Most of the time, um, well, they say we take over a hundred types of insurance, but usually out of network um, insurances have to be uh, initiated by the patient. Our care coordinator, Brenna Steinhardt, will assist the families with all the forms, referrals and paperwork, um, but insurances won't talk to her unless the patient initiates that discussion and initial uh, reason for referral. So similar to Dr. Pernosian, I think some, some patients will have to do an a la carte um, process for certain services, but not all. 
This is our phone number, 310-423-7779. Um, Brenna's direct number is 310-423-8061. I did put in my uh, contact number as well if you want to contact me directly. So that those are my slides. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit over time or um, happy to hey, take questions. You're perfect. Well. You're perfect. Thank you so much. We'd like to um, introduce um, UC Irvine. Sorry, forgot to unmute. <laughs> we can hear you now. I'm sorry, I wasn't quite prepared. I thought Loma Linda was coming ahead. They were, but the, the doctor wasn't able to make it. I'm sorry to throw you off. No, that's okay. Uh... Okay. Sorry, there we go. Can you see those now? Yes. Okay, thanks very much to all of you for uh, allowing us to have this presentation and it helps us to all get to know one another as well. So that's been, I think, good for all of us. Um, I'm, uh, my name is Maureen Boshan. I'm a clinical geneticist at the University of California, Irvine. Um, we have uh, actually three clinic sites, um, all of which uh, deal with patients with um, neurofibromatosis and schwannomatosis. And it doesn't want to... Sorry, um, we're in Orange County, obviously. Um, uh, our three clinic sites, our main clinic site is at uh, University of California, Ir University of California Irvine Medical Center in Orange. Um, we have another uh, clinic at uh, Miller Children's Hospital in Long Beach and another one at Chalk Children's Hospital in Orange. Uh, you will find that there are two different uh, genetics clinics at Chalk and um, they're unrelated. So you just wanna be careful which one you're uh, making an appointment with. Um, we also have a, a new uh, uh, large and uh, wonderful medical center coming in on the border of uh, Irvine and Newport Beach. This is uh, our UC Irvine Medical Center Clinic. This is where we have our adult genetics clinic, um, actually in this building, uh, ac actually in, it's an adjacent building to this one. Uh, the appointment number at UCI is over here, 714-456-7002. Um, and this is the uh, Douglas uh, Hospital at U UC Irvine Medical Center. Uh, this is our... Uh, staff at the um, adult clinic at UC Irvine Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Angela Myers is uh, a clinical geneticist and also uh, in family medicine. So well, uh, well experienced with adult medical care as well as pediatrics. Um, Dr. Junan Gold uh, is another one of our um, physicians and Megan Gillespie and Catherine Hall are our genetic counselors. Uh, in that clinic. Additional facilities of interest for individuals with NF and schwannomatosis at UCI uh, would be the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. That's on our campus uh, medical facility in the city of Irvine uh, with extensive uh, specialties and subspecialties in ophthalmology and neuro-ophthalmology. Uh, the Chow Family Com Comprehensive Cancer Center um, in on the uh, UCI Medical Center campus in Orange and the Beckman Laser Institute, which uh, does a, um, a significant amount of laser surgery uh, that's on our medical campus in Irvine. We also have the UCI Center for Autism and Neurodevelopmental Disorders, which has a large 
group of uh, child neurologists, child uh, developmental specialists, autism specialists, um, and sees individuals up to age 21, if I'm, I think I'm correct on that. And that's in Tustin. Uh, just to show you some of the plans for the new hospital and that's coming on the border of Irvine and Newport Beach, um, which, well, which will have um, all of our uh, clinical facilities uh, duplicated from what we have at UCI Medical Center in Orange um, and state-of-the-art hospital and other facilities. Um, this is our clinic at Miller Children's and Women's Hospital in Long Beach. This here is the uh, appointment phone number. Um, this is the um, Children's Village, uh, which is a, a an outpatient uh, clinical center where all of our clinical, all of the clinical activities for pediatrics at this hospital are held. Um, this just opened about a month ago, and it's beautiful. It has all kinds of facilities uh, for children. It has a playroom, a place where um, other uh, siblings of, of the patients can, can be um, cared for while the parents are with their child um, in, uh, in the clinic. Um, it has special MRI facilities uh, that are uh, adapted particularly to children and can do 3D imaging and other kinds of um, uh, new technology. Uh, this is our staff at the Miller Clinic. Dr. Myers and, and Megan Gillespie also uh, staff that clinic. Katie Singh is another one of the genetic counselors um, with particular experience in uh, oncology. Uh, and Natalie Gallant and Leslie Raffle are uh, two other clinical geneticists um, some of these people look pretty young, but they've all got extensive experience in uh, clinical genetics and are all quite familiar with uh, NF. Uh, and this is Chalk Children's where we have another pediatric clinic. This is in Orange, California. Um, it is, our clinic is listed as the UCI Biochemical Genetics Clinic, but it is a general uh, clinical genetics uh, uh, clinic and we see uh, quite a number of patients with neurofibromatosis. This is only for pediatrics. And this is our staff at uh, Chalk Children's. Um, uh, Dr. Kimonas and I are the clinicians and uh, Catherine Hall is the genetic counselor. Um, to answer the questions, what ages are our clinic patients? UCI Medical Center is the one where we see adult patients. Uh, and it's our adult genetics clinic, and we see patients 18 years and older. At Miller Children's and Chalk Children's, we see patients up to 18 years. Um, and our uh, prenatal genetic service will also see individuals for uh, preconception or, or prenatal genetic counseling and genetic diagnosis. All three of these hospitals have the full range of pediatric and or adult medical and surgical specialists including, um, I can read all of these, but I don't know if, uh, I mean, they're all pretty much anything that anybody with NF could need or schwannomatosis could need is available um, uh, at, at our centers. And in addition, UCI has a large dermatology department with 19 faculty specialists um, who can provide um, uh, various treatments for individuals with NF. Um, can patients see multiple NF specialists on the same day? We don't have a multidisciplinary clinics for NF, but we can easily facilitate some same day appointments with more than one specialist, sometimes uh, one or two additional specialists uh, to genetics. Um, and we arrange these on an individual basis. Um, each of the three hospitals accepts a wide uh, variety of insurances, including Medi-Cal and Medicare and TRICARE. Um, we have team members who can help with out-of-network referrals in every hospital. And all three hospitals have various types of financial assistance and discounted care for low-income, uninsured, and underinsured patients. Um, all three clinics also have interpreter services 
in multiple languages that are uh, usually computer-based, but some of the more common languages uh, in our area, Spanish and uh, Southeast Asian languages uh, can be in person. What is our philosophy regarding routine MRI studies? So the question whether or not to do a routine uh, MRI scan of the brain and orbits at the time of diagnosis, if there are no symptoms, is controversial. Uh, some of the arguments in favor uh, is having a baseline, which means your, your very first study so you can see if anything changes subsequently and identifying any potential complications before they cause symptoms can be quite valuable. On the other hand, uh, some thoughts against it are the cost uh, because the majority of time they're gonna be normal if you're just doing them as a routine uh, study, uh, especially if there are no symptoms. Uh, the need for anesthesia in small children, and, find, and, and sometimes we find things that we call findings of uncertain significance, so we don't know necessarily what they mean or if they're going to progress and get worse or cause problems, and that causes more and more uh, MRI studies and other imaging. It, there's a financial burden, there's uh, anxiety that can be caused by that. And so those are some of the arguments against it. So what we do is we discuss with each patient the pros and cons of doing this kind of uh, baseline MRI scan. And uh, we discuss it with the patient or the parents and we decide together on a case by case basis. Are we involved in clinical trials? Um, we work with uh, clinical trials when they are available for patients with particular uh, difficulties that they would apply to. So every time we see a patient, we check uh, clinicaltrials.gov. And when we see a patient with a potentially treatable complication and discuss enrollment with patients or their parents, uh, when, it's appro when appropriate trials are available. So I just want to uh, suggest that people make appointments with us in advance as much as possible because we do have uh, quite a long waiting list at all three centers. I'd like to thank NF California and the NF Network for everything they do to help patients, families, and providers. Uh, special thanks to Maria, Debbie, Katie, and Brianna for helping us uh, reach everybody today. And many thanks to our patients for your confidence in us and in our um, colleagues. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Boshian. Thank you so much. So next we have Children's Hospital, Orange County. Hi, can everyone hear me and see me okay? Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay, great, I apologize. I don't know for any of you guys out there, um, I'm trying to um, be a mom at the same time. It's my champion son's uh, championship game and uh, I wanted to be part of this uh, Zoom call. Um, I apologize, uh, I don't actually have slides to present to you guys today, but um, if uh, there are going to be uh, slides that are gonna be sent out to the, um, uh, the families afterwards, I'm more than happy to send my information and the contacts for our clinics over to you guys so that you can send it over to the families. Um, I Perfect. thank you for uh, the NF network um, and the families who are participating in today's uh, session today. Um, I will tell you that for me, um, again, my name is Carol Lynn. I'm one of the pediatric oncologists at Chalk. Um, I've been uh, actually involved with our NF team for uh, probably uh, close to 10 years now. Um, and uh, we've evolved a lot uh, in our hospital um, in terms of our commitment to NF. Uh, so uh, in the very beginning, um, you know, our, our NF is actually driven a lot by our genetics team and for over 20 years they've had a you know a, you know nf clinic available for all the patients and families seeing nf1 nf2 and uh, schwannomatosis. Uh, last couple of years, though, uh, our team got together and decided to uh, open a multidisciplinary NF program, uh, which has been really great. And so that comprises of uh, oncology, neurology, genetics, neurosurgery, 
and also our orthopedic surgeons are involved. Of course, we have close collaborations with um, ophthalmology. Uh, we refer uh, usually uh, through either to CHOC or UCI to neuro-oncology and also up in the LA area as well. Um, we, we find that, of course, psychosocial developmental for our um, NF patients are extremely important. So uh, we have great collaboration uh, with our psychosocial team here as well. Um, we, we are very happy to be part of the Children's Tumor Foundation and a NFCN affiliate clinic. Um, it's been a lot of hard work, uh, you know, doctors a day, uh, it's a team of mom and daughter who usually gives these talks on an annual basis. Um, and so they're the ones that really drive um, our NF program at CHOC. Um, but we are more than willing to, uh, you know, see new patients and referrals. Um, usually uh, what happens is it depends on what the family and the patient needs. And so usually if it's gone through the genetics team first, then uh, Dr. Zadeh will let our oncology uh, team know that there's someone who urgently needs to be seen and either we'll see them in the clinic in our setting first, or we'll try to schedule them in that multidisciplinary clinic. Um, and so our multidisciplinary clinic meets every two months, once every two months. And so if there is a concern or urgent uh, referral necessary, then sometimes we can group ourselves with the uh, specialists that are necessary and do a telehealth session with that family right away. Uh, so I want people to know that, um, you know, we don't have to delay in having multi-specialists see a family or patient um, just because our, uh, you know, that clinic is unavailable for every two months. And again, we are more than happy to uh, field in our own uh, clinic as well, uh, first before referring to the NF multidisciplinary team. Um, within oncology, um, I will tell you that at CHOC, uh, we can see actually patients up to 26 years of age. Um, and so for me, um, you know, I actually, um, have a more of a heart for the plexiform neurofibromas. I'm not a neuro-oncologist, but my partner who is one, uh, Dr. Chenu Abangwa, uh, he, he will see all the brain tumors um, and the optic gliomas um, and, and a lot of the NF2s. So it's been a great collaboration for our oncology team. Um, and again, with the geneticists and our neurosurgeons, there are multiple neuro surgeons that come to uh, the NF multidisciplinary clean team and are part of the NF um, network uh, at CHOC. Uh, same with neurology. We have multiple neurologists who are committed uh, to the NF team as well. Um, in regards to um, uh, studies that are presently done um, at CHOC, um, again, my heart is with plexiforms. And so, um, you know, I've been extremely, um, you know, working closely with NIH initially before the MEK inhibitors were FDA approved, the um, uh, for us to be able to provide that for families out there uh, without having to go through trial. So before then, it was a lot of NIH uh, collaboration, collaboration with CHLA as well for some of the trials that they have open, um, and then uh, being able to provide now uh, selumetinib, uh, you know, uh, since it's FDA approved, not on study. Uh, we're in the process of getting um, uh, approval for the miratinib uh, bank inhibitor as well at our site, and so I'm hoping to open that uh, shortly, and I'm excited because then we can give medications, especially to the younger kids with plexiforms, uh, who won't need to be able to swallow tablets and can have a liquid formation. Uh, so that's been uh, really exciting to see come through uh, at our site. Um, when it comes to transition of care, so, you know, like I said, I can see up to 26 and our geneticists, um, you know, they, they actually see a lot longer um, into adults as well as a pediatric population. Um, so we will sometimes continue on uh, uh, taking care of our kids for an extended period. But once they age out at one point, uh, then we have to refer over usually to our UCI counterpart partners uh, to take care of our, our, our patients, which has been a very helpful and a smooth transition. Um, uh, I think uh, in terms of uh, being able to find us uh, to uh, try to get into clinic, and again, I, I apologize, I don't have the slides to show you, but if you just go into our CHOC website, um, and you look up under uh, genetics or neurofibromatosis, uh, you'll see more information. And again, I'm more than happy to uh, send out the, um, the slides of our contact information. Uh, you could always email me personally too. Um, I'm more than happy to field any uh, uh, patient uh, referrals that needs to go through either genetics or our multidisciplinary team. Um, and uh, I'll send that uh, as well. Uh, but usually if you, if you call our clinic, 714-509-4348, uh, uh, you can get a hold of uh, the NF coordinator for oncology. And then also uh, there's an NF coordinator uh, for the genetics team as well. Um, 
we are uh, always excited to be part of, um, you know, the NF consortium and uh, take part in a lot of the other additional activities, the um, different uh, NF California walks. Uh, hopefully other families are going to participate this year, uh, both in LA area and also in uh, San Diego. Um, we're looking to definitely continue collaboration with UCI and CHLA, which are our neighbors, um, and, and Radies as well. Um, so yeah, I think I will uh, eventually send you guys more information so that you have the exact contact and the uh, team members that you need to contact uh, when it comes to uh, being uh, referred to our team and also seeing some of our specialists. And then just so you know, um, we also have our uh, plastics uh, surgeons who work with us closely when it comes to uh, different uh, potential disfiguring um, uh, cutaneous uh, or uh, neurofibromas or plexiforms as well. Um, and uh, we, we do our uh, bi -month, uh, twice a month tumor board for neuro-oncology uh, whenever there are uh, issues of uh, NF2, um, uh, vestibular stromomas or uh, optic gliomas. And then uh, sometimes uh, I will present in our regular uh, genoc tumor board when it comes to those plexiforms that if I have any indication of a possible transformation to malignant uh, peripheral nursery tumors. Um, I think that's about it. Thank you very much for your time. And again, I apologize for trying to multitask this today. No, uh, go mom, team. go team, go mom. That was great. Thank you so much. And we'll take you up on the offer for slides later after the fact so that everything's. Thank you so much. That was great. Go team. Um, so now I would like to introduce um, UC San Diego. Go. Dr. Piccioni. Sorry there, I was having problems unmuting my microphone. Um, Give me one second here. Can everybody see my slide? We see you. Oh, all right. I tried to uh, share the screen there. Let's see what happens. Now we see a slide. Thank you. Um, so my name is David Picchioni. I'm a neurologist and neuro-oncologist at, uh, at UC San Diego. Um, I see the adult NF1 uh, and 2 patients and schwannomatosis patients. Um, most of what I was going to do today was talk a little bit about some of the subspecialty care we have on the adult side um, and answer some of the questions you had put forward at the beginning. So um, in terms of our location, we're located at, um, at basically the main university campus in La Jolla. And uh, my clinic and uh, most of the other clinics of the people I'm gonna talk about are actually at the cancer center um, or the immediately surrounding clinic buildings in that area. So I do take care of adults and in the adult space, we are limited to those 18 and older. And I think you're gonna hear from Radies Children's just after this in terms of um, the pediatric care in the San Diego area. Uh, we do see both NF1 and NF2, and actually we have um, some subspecialty care in NF2 that I wanted to highlight as well uh, today. Let me go to my next slide. So here are some of the um, specialists that we have at UC San Diego that are involved in NF care. And unfortunately, it, we don't have a, um, a single NF clinic. The care is decentralized and basically a referral pattern amongst these different providers. And really, once you start to get into any of those individual providers, um, you'll probably get connected up with the other providers and the other specialists that you, that you need or as you see fit. Um, I do a lot of the... Um, tumor care for, for any patients that have uh, any kind of tumors, both brain, central nervous system, and external that sort of need their routine monitoring, and also some of their other, set them up basically for their routine care in terms of yearly audiograms or 
ophthalmology exams, et cetera. And so I sort of kind of head up the main care and then some of these other specialists come into play in terms of uh, if we need referrals to different specialists. Uh, the first two people I would like to highlight are the, the Mark Schwartz and Rick Friedman, who really run the acoustic neuroma program here. So they have a, um, you know, a, a real interest in NF2, um, especially in the sort of surgical care of acoustic neuromas. And they really try to focus on hearing preservation techniques, since that's the, you know, thing that kind of gives patients the most problems in that, in that population. Um, they often perform these surgeries together and are really looking to build an NF2 uh, comprehensive clinic where people do get to come and see all the specialists at one point, but we don't really have that in place yet, but both of them are actually very interested in doing that and looking to build towards that uh, in the near future. Um, Mark Schwartz as our neurosurgeon will also address other surgical issues that may arise, um, you know, from NF1 or NF2 as one of our primary tumor surgeons. So if other things, um, such as other gliomas or meningiomas or ependymomas arise, he would be our surgeon that takes care, takes care of those. On the adult side, our adult geneticist is um, Lisa Madalensky, and, um, and she has a, a team of other genetic counselors under her as well, and she runs the genetic uh, counseling clinic at the Cancer Center for NF and really other, uh, other cancer-related issues. Uh, in terms of additional uh, surgical care, um, we have uh, two surgeons I'd like to highlight in the from surgical oncology. One is Jason Siklik at the bottom, and uh, the uh, the other is uh, Frank Charapa, um, and they are orthopedic oncology and surgical oncology. Uh, Jason Siklik is especially a, a GI surgeon and uh, has a specialty in sort of gists that may arrive or other GI-based tumors that that might might arise. Um, Frank is our peripheral surgeon, and he also deals especially with um, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors and sort of watching legions and make sure that things aren't, um, aren't undergoing transformation and when they do, providing the appropriate surgical care. And in the you know, rare case that things do devolve into a, mal a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor in, um, in NF1 patients, um, we send them to sarcoma oncology, which is Sarah Bowles featured there as the person who kind of runs their chemotherapy care if, um, if that's what's needed. And then lastly, uh, we have a, a large dermatology program at UC San Diego, but Brian's son is really most focused on sort of genetic skin diseases, especially neurofibromatosis. And so for the dermatologic needs, that's the person on our team that we, we usually refer to the most. And then we move in the other services, pain management, ophthalmology, et cetera. As we, as we need those other, other services. In terms of same day appointments, we don't have a coordinated clinic, as I said before, so we don't do same day appointments, although we do try to coordinate the care and get it done as much as possible. It is sometimes possible to get a few specialists on the same day, but for the most part, they're individual clinics that are all just geographically located in, this, in the same place. That being said, when we have difficult cases, uh, they do go to our uh, neuro-oncology tumor board for a discussion and the, the people here are present and really kind of discuss how to move forward in more difficult cases when sort of symptomatic or problematic tumors arise that we need some plan to address those. In terms of clinical trials in the adult space we don't really have any clinical trials that are specifically for NF1 or NF2 what we do, but we do have some clinical trials available. And those clinical trials are usually for those rare tumor types that might arise in those different conditions, especially in the, in the NF2 setting. Um, and uh, so things like meningiomas or ependymomas that patients with, um, the patients with NF2 get, uh, we do have clinical trials at our site for different therapies for those, such as a uh, immune therapy trial that's going on right now or different targeted therapies for meningiomas that might arise. And those tumor, those trials take all meningiomas or all ependymomas, um, not just patients with NF2, but NF2 is not an exclusionary criteria. So they're actually able to go and get on those trials. And we've put a number of patients on those trials um, here, at our, here at our facility. You know, things like the MEK inhibitors and selumetinib aren't really a FDA approved yet in the adult population are just starting to get approved. And what we do have at the cancer centers, we have a team of people um, 
who work on um, authorizations for off-label medications. And so that's been a, a big help to our NF patients who are, have been looking to get on MEK inhibitors, but have sort of aged out of the pediatric population. And um, so we have a precision medicine team and a, an off team really dedicated just to that. And we've gotten a number of, of, of patients on MEK inhibitors as young adults um, and been able to get responses and get um, get benefit for them. So that, that would also sort of run through our program in the cancer center as well. And it's one thing we have access to. Um, and then lastly, uh, in terms of contact information and insurance information, um, UC San Diego does have a health insurance navigator, and that's basically a number to call to tell them what insurance you have and if you're covered or not. And then they also have resources to, if you need to either, you know, get outside referrals or get your insurance switched to a plan that is, is uh, covered by UC San Diego, there's a, a, web, uh, a website there as well you can go to to sort of start that process. So that's one way that patients kind of can see if they're covered and then see what things they can do to get into our clinics and be seen. And then the two appointment numbers in the middle there are actually the first number is the general UC San Diego um, referral line. And then the second number is our direct clinic number at the, at the cancer center to set up, uh, set up an appointment through there. So that was all I really wanted to cover today. And just thank you again for having me on to, to speak. And um, hopefully we can hear about the, uh, the care at uh, the pediatric care in San Diego from, from Radies. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Piccioni. Um, Dr. Uh, Marilyn Jones from Rady Children's is next. We welcome you, Dr. Jones. Thank you. Um, I do not have any, uh, any slides uh, to share, but I'm happy to send uh, contact uh, information. Um, I, I would say that um, the situation at Rady mimics the situation um, at UCSD on the adult side is that we've got all the position players, but no centralized quarterback. Uh, so. I, our genetics division uh, actually for the kids uh, functions very much uh, the same way at Chuck as sort of the starting point uh, for many people. And then depending upon what you need, we can get you to orthopedics if that's the issue, neuro-oncology if that's the issue, um, the craniofacial team if that's the issue, plastic surgery if they're annoying uh, fibromas, um, so we end up being sort of the traffic control point, but, but there is not a dedicated uh, clinic at, um, at Rady. Um, Rady has about a 90% market share. Other than Kaiser, I think we take every kind of insurance. So that should not be, um, that should not be a problem for anybody getting care. Um, Rady will allow us to see uh, patients up until 20 to 23 years of age. Um, certainly through the genetics program and some of the subspecialists, uh, we can continue to follow people uh, as outpatients, but hospitalization or surgery would need to be done on the, uh, would need to transfer to the adult side. And we try to partner with, uh, with UCSD uh, to transfer care to specialists there if, um, if that as an individual sort of ages out of the pediatric uh, population. I'm looking here at what are the other questions. Um, I think we've got um, specialists, any kind of specialists that you would need. There are no specific um, NF related trials, but there are trials going on with MEK inhibitors. Uh, and there are folks who are on MEK inhibitors, usually with John Crawford through the neuro-oncology uh, program here. Uh, so that is accessible to uh, children that need that kind of uh, that kind of management. Um, what else? Uh, seeing multiple specialists on the same day, I think, is really much the same as uh, as at UCSD. Uh, with advanced planning, uh, you can um, make multiple appointments on the same day, but it's not in a dedicated NF-related clinic where you just come to one place and stay and the specialists would, would come to you. Um, that, that is a weakness in our, uh, in our facility. We've tried on a number of occasions to get a dedicated clinic and it just has not, uh, it has not happened. Um, I, I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any questions, but um, I, I'm sure that this is looking very similar to what other people have said. 
We, uh, we didn't set it up as a question and answer because of the number of speakers and everything, okay. but uh, we are grateful for your participation and would welcome the follow-up slide for contact information. Okay. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. In, in fact, I think we've covered all of the, the speakers who agreed to introduce their facilities and um, the presentations were amazing, really exceeded our expectations. There was so much information. And Brianna will tell you a little bit about how we gather that and share that after Debbie and I um, uh, say a few words. Um, so thank you again to the speakers for giving our audience a much better idea of what resources are available to NF patients throughout the state. Um, to maximize the benefits of this morning, uh, Debbie, Maria, and I will um, follow up with the help of Brianna and request any missing contact information to help our community locate and gain access to the best specialists uh, available for each NF patient's needs. We want to have we want to have everything just easy for you to access. Um, and NF California's find a doctor list on our website actually links to the NF network. So by doing this process today, hearing the speakers and um, and then us capturing the information, um, both sites will be updated in the process, which will help in the um, months to come. And, and to our muted and in, in, invisible audience, thank you for taking the time to gather this information so you can seek out the best care uh, possible. We realize that you, some of you may have wonderful primary care physicians or a particular specialist who's been super helpful to you. And we welcome that information as well. If you want to send it to info at nfcalifornia.org, or you can use info at nfcalifornia.org if you have a question after the webinar that you didn't get a chance to put in the chat. Um, we, we do have a form that Debbie created and I think uh, Brianna will explain how those kinds of things can be available after the meeting. Again, thank you for spending your morning with us. And um, Debbie, are you on? Would you like to say anything? Otherwise, Brianna. Yeah, I don't see Debbie jumping on at the moment, so I'm happy to jump in here as well. Um, and then Debbie, if you wanna jump on at uh, the end here, I would be happy to turn that back over to you. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for joining in today. We truly appreciate not only the time of all of the speakers and presenters today, but also the time of the team at NF California. Um, all of the information regarding the webinar recording and uh, contact information for all of the uh, physicians and clinics that we heard from today, we're hoping to distribute um, sometime next week. You will be getting a follow-up reminder or a follow-up email from Zoom with a link to the webinar recording. We hope to have that to you by uh, tomorrow afternoon. It will be visible on uh, our YouTube page and uh, closed captioning will also be available via YouTube. Um, as far as the contact information, like I said, we will be following up uh, with an individual email, hopefully in a Google uh, form type document or a Dropbox folder with all the contact information for the clinics that we're speaking. Um, and I think uh, that will just about do it. If there are any questions, I am going to just share my screen here for a moment. Um, we do have the contact information for the team there at NF California, uh, uh, Debbie Bell, Maria Powell, and Katie Sparing, uh, as well as their website and their cell phone number here as well as the NF Network website if you're looking for additional information on uh, educational materials, uh, previous webinar recordings, things like that. Those are all available on our website as well. So we thank you again for tuning in today. Uh, Katie, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we uh, end this year? I think Debbie might be back at her desk. She's, she's trying to double duty as grandma. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back. Um, we're in between little league games right now, so I had to get one ready and one out. So um, I wanted to thank everybody so much for today. It's been rough not being involved with NF California. Well, we're involved with NF California, but not doing our events and the things that we've done in the past and just reminiscing down memory lane as far as all the faces and the walks that we've done up here in Vacaville. And so I just wanted to thank everybody for taking your um, time out of today's schedule, the speakers, 
Um, and for those that didn't have PowerPoints, it wasn't a requirement. We even said, Lucy Goosey, just come in and tell us about your clinic because we get calls all the time, our insurance change, we don't know where to start, where do we go, what do we do? And so this was over and beyond amazing. So I wanted to thank everybody, the attendees, the panelists, everybody. So have a great weekend and let's look forward to our next webinar. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone.